Hello everyone, welcome to the IPFS Core Implementations Weekly Sync for Monday the 13th of July 2020. Uh, I am Making Brain, I will be your host. We are going to go through uh, the high priority initiatives and the other initiatives everyone's working on and give some updates. So, high priority initiatives. Number one, upcoming and ship releases. We talk a little bit about JS IPFS. It's going to be released, it's going to be released tomorrow. Uh, there were some bugs, um, there was a memory leak that we got a fix in for thanks to Jacob. Um, so I wanted to kind of wait for that to be in before releasing it. So I'm going to do it first thing tomorrow morning. That's going to happen. <laughs> Hold on a second. So I'm writing right here, right? I did this part of the video. It's okay. No, I won't. This is going to be on YouTube. You're going to be famous. Sorry, I didn't hear. Is, it, is that oh here, here? Okay. Upcoming ship releases. So, um, pen, pending due to bug fixes. Um, while you're typing, are there any other pending or ship releases? Upcoming and ship releases, even. Nope. Okay. Moving on. Pinning services. Who can give an update about pinning services? Yeah. Uh, so today is the date when we are finalizing MVP. Uh, that means we say we are uh, dropping the final version of the spec this week. Um, the link to the issue is in the notes. Um, the ask here is for anyone interested in generic pinning service, uh, services API um, to review the specs. I also linked a uh, human readable version. We have a uh, open API uh, spec uh, and human readable version of that. Uh, the plan is to finalize the spec within, like before the end of this week, hopefully in next week, uh, two days. And then we will ask uh, uh, core implementations working group, uh, IPFS GUI working group, and uh, various spinning services and Falcon partners uh, who are interested in implementing something like this to give a sign off or to give uh, last minute uh, suggestions and changes. Uh, but long story short, we want to close this, uh, uh, freeze it uh, this week um, and agree on a version that can be implemented. We, we may tweak small things uh, as we go, of course, when people implement stuff and figure out, oh, this is not the best way to do this. But uh, we don't expect huge changes. Uh, and we mostly reduce the scope to make it um, like a smaller surface, less problems, easier for people to agree on. So takeaway from here is please review this and open any issues if you find anything uh, concerning. Yeah. Cool, moving on. Uh, ED25519 default keys. Yes. Um... Yeah, so the subdomain support for ED keys is done. That got merged on Friday, I think. Woohoo! Um, the we need to finish up initial initialization work um, for IPFS init with ED keys. Uh, that is, I believe, blocked on me fixing the thing in JS lib PDP, um, so that IPNS does not break for JS when we we launch that. Um, so I'll be I'll be getting back to that this week. There were a few bugs that popped up last week um, that I needed to attend to, but I'll get back to that this week. Um, key rotation is ready, but that's blocked on getting that done as well, just so that we can have, if we need to, if we want to roll out key rotation early, we could do that with just RSA default support. Um, but right now we, we would like to get in um, ED default support for that um, before pulling that done. And then um, IPFS keygen list also now supports output for base 36 and CIDV1 thanks to Pitar. 
I don't, is there any other things there, Eddie, that I didn't cover? Uh, so if I'm not mistaken, we should be able to, uh, unless I'm missing something on the JS part, but we should be able to close a cascade of, of PRs and get the default in. But Dean can correct me if I'm missing something on the JS side. Yeah, no, it's that's fine. We can wait. I think probably the smartest way to do this actually is to uh, take the key rotation and the initialization stuff and merge all of those, but have the default set to RSA and then have another PR, which is the change all the defaults PR, um, which just changes all the defaults to uh, elliptic curves and also does things like changes the IPNS outputs to base 36 by default and whatever. So I mean, it's basically just going to be like an output changing and default changing PR and that way we can merge all the stuff that does like actual new features. Okay. I think that's probably the smartest way to do this so that we're not like waiting around too long on, on merging things that are actually useful. So the default for the uh, PRID encoding and the actual key type. You want to uh, change them in the same PR? Okay, well, we can talk. Probably, about. yeah. PRID, I think we still have to figure out because there's like lib P2P things that we have to worry about and go multi adder, but IPNS should be easy to do. Uh, next up is subdomain gateway. Yeah, so uh, two fun uh, PRs got merged this week. One is my PR uh, with ED255.19 support in subdomains uh, that defaults all the lip 2 p keys to base 36. So we don't mix uh, different bases within IPNS namespace. And uh, yeah, this version is very simple. If your or, uh, if your uh, CID is too long, we try to convert it to represent it uh, in base thirty six. If it does not help, we return an error that sorry, this is too long for DNS spec. Uh, you can still load it from a path based gateway. Uh, however, for subdomains, we just return uh, an error we don't do any magical conversion. Mm, so yeah, that's it, that got merged. And the second one is contributed, uh, I believe from, uh, by Michael Muir uh, from Infura. It's a cool PR which adds supports to a sibling header, X forwarded host. We already supported X forwarded port. Both headers are commonly used by reverse proxies. And this one enables uh, reverse proxy to override the uh, host name of the subdomain gateway. Uh, you may have different uses for this header, but the, probably the most common one is when you want to uh, enable subdomain support on existing uh, gateway, but you want to redirect it to a different host name to keep uh, origin isolation uh, and like redirect to a new subdomain on a different base domain. Uh, yeah, check the. Uh, PR for details, but that's it. Uh, there are also docs updated. Uh, yeah, that's it. Cool. Uh, I think there's anyone here from the Rust initiative. Um, so moving on to lib P2P uh, rendezvous. Uh, hey, so yeah, uh, the, I basically started the second iteration uh, last week, and with that, I already tackled uh, a plan in a doc for how we will integrate this in lib uh, regarding what will be the responsibility of the user and what will be the responsibility of lib itself. Uh, then I also implemented the garbage collector for the server, which basically uh, uh, deletes the uh, rendezvous registers who are already um, discarded for the direct detail. Then I also uh, got the cookies for discovering queries. Uh, so basically, we, we when we ask for a rendezvous server for peers, we will we'll not receive the, the ones that we already received, as we will store a reference of the ones that we received before. 
then I also got it compliant with the interface peer discovery from uh, LibHP. Uh, and with this, we can basically plug, plug it in as a discovery, any other discovery. And uh, basically each time it emits an event, we'll uh, uh, record everything in the address book and it will be basically the same as uh, any other uh, peer discovery service unless uh, uh, the user wants to uh, do itself the, the discovery, which uh, through config it can also do. So for getting this to a next review, I basically need to get some cleanup on this and also add uh, more tests and it's not uh, totally covered yet. And uh, after that also just integrating the assigned peer records uh, to the exchange of multi others. Uh, and for the next initiative, the signed peer records and the gossip cell 101, uh, the signed peer records, I'm still blocked on reviews. So mostly no progress since last week and the uh, gossip sub uh, came and was also uh, not working on this last week. So basically also not uh, any relevant progress. And that's it. Okay, that's the end of the, uh, the high priority initiative. So moving on to the other initiatives, uh, UNIXFS 1.5 and Go. Any update? See a Peter Robinson on the call. Yeah, I just jumped in. Uh, I haven't heard anything on that one. Uh, they were pinged a couple of weeks ago to ask if there's progress and there was no reply. Okay, uh, migrating some more task keys in the block store. Same, same as last week. It will be in the next release. Uh, pending system revamp uh, is also much the same. Um, a few outstanding questions uh, on the the uh, migration page, uh, the repo migration PR. Um, um, shared IP for snow is next. Yeah, go, um, go for it. Uh, since last week, uh, I got a review feedback that I'll be acting on, upon. Um, Doug PB changes had finally got merged and released, but that was a major release, so I'll have to propagate those across all the other libraries like uh, UnixFS, and I'm sure as there's more. Once that is done, I think it should be ready for another uh, review cycle. Um, the next one is also mine, which is improving web file add. Um, currently, there is a JS IPFS pull request in review. Um, we had a call last week and made a decision about going with a custom form data implementations that use blobs under the hood. Uh, we may reconsider the decision later on uh, in favor of using form native form data because it turns out metadata support is only implementing JS IPFS, so maybe changing it now won't be too bad, uh, or there will be no better time to, to do that. Uh, but we don't want to block this work on the decision. Um, I'm writing some more tests to kind of catch regressions that might arise because there are a lot, long process of normalization happening uh, that current tests would not catch. Um, I also spent some time trying to see if we can use fetch blob as Hugo uh, suggested last week at our call. Uh, there are some issues with uh, fetch blob and I start working with a fetch blob, uh, fetch blob uh, project to try to see if we can address those. Uh, in, but I think some of those could be uh, just ignored for now. So as long as we have a decision, we can go one way or the other on that too. Uh, so once I hear back, maybe from Alex, with executive decision, which one to use, we can move on and use the one that is right. Uh, that's it. I will get to all that stuff as soon as I've done the release. Uh, that's it. Uh, design review proposals. Um, has anybody got anything they want to propose for a design review? Lockers and asks. I'd just ask to check pinning services APIs if you have spare five minutes, just if anything sticks out. Yeah. Um, I have some items on questions, although I'm not sure if they should be asks or questions, uh, but I'll bring them up. 
unless somebody wants to go with the asks before. Um, I, I, I don't know when the right time for this is, but I did come on to like address some concerns that people had around some of the new multi-format stuff. So we can talk about that whenever is the right time to talk about it. Uh, but I, I will go through my quickly and maybe we can do that after. Uh, so one thing that I brought up, uh, can we consider something like RFC process, maybe inspired by Rust? It really works well in Rust project. It gives you a clear framework of how you get from the idea to either throwing that idea away or actually getting it in. Um, I've been struggling trying to figure out how to navigate the process here. But I think another really big benefit to RFC process is that it empowers community to also drive changes and not be localized in the, within the same organization. Uh, it would be nice to have RFC process to kind of decide how to get to the decision whether we should adopt RFC process or not. Uh, but due to lack of it, maybe we can figure something out. I, I don't know how to have this conversation, but I'm throwing it out here and maybe some of you can guide me. Inter interesting fact, we sort of tried to introduce RFC for the P2P project. And I actually wrote the first one. <laughs> so uh, that was the only one. Not sure <laughs> if that means no one dragged the so same fail. I did. So, but. <laughs> so I, so I, I do like Rust's RFC process. I think that it's sort of impossible to go from no process to an RFC process. Like you, you need to take like some steps before that. Like documenting some governance and how decisions get made would be like a, a logical kind of first step. Um, I don't think that that's documented anywhere. We, we did something like that just for IPLD specifications because all the libraries are pretty much single maintainer. So we don't have like a, we don't need a lot of formal governance there yet. Um, but in specs, like all of us have to weigh in and it becomes kind of unclear like how to unblock things and how a decision gets formalized. So we wrote up like a very kind of minimal governance um, system just for specs. And that's actually gone really well and, and unblocked a lot of things. And it's not nearly as formal or as much process as an RFC process, but it has allowed us to like close things quicker. Um, and it has allowed us to um, narrow in on who the decision makers are when we're making a decision and how objections are raised. So um, that might be um, something that you could check out. And that, that's only in IPLD specs right now, though. We, we haven't done that in multi-formats. So we probably need to move it over to multi-formats as well now that we're doing that. Yeah, so I, I didn't mean to like just go with the Rust model. Uh, I think it will be developed over time, but starting some process would be helpful. Oftentimes I find myself in a position where I start a discussion and some people respond and then you don't know what that means. Does it mean it's a bad idea? Does it mean like uh, we, we don't have time to work on it? Or if we don't, then who can, like it becomes unclear what how to act upon things. So having yeah. a process that is describes how you can act on things would be really helpful, I think. And not just internally, also externally mm -hmm. for people to know how they can navigate this space. Um, yep. I, I would say that like at this stage, the most important thing is that there's something that makes people formalize their objections. So you can comment and have an opinion, but like a formal objection is something that you say like much clearer. Um, and when you're asking like, hey, are there any more objections? at this point, like objections need to be very clearly stated. Like, no, I don't think that this should go in for this reason. Um, so that people have something actionable that they can do to potentially change your mind. Um, and, and it just delineates between like, I, I have a passing concern that I don't really care about from actually you should not put this code in. Because it's really hard to differentiate when you're not the person who makes the comment. Exactly. Um, so how do we take this from just bringing it up here to actually something? We can take that offline, but I would like this to actually happen somehow, and I'm happy to do the work that is necessary to get there. Um, yeah, I think uh, the big thing here is probably to just go into the, uh, we're talking about doing this for the IPFS org, um, add it as, as the main issue in IPFS, IPFS repo, and then um, kick that discussion off there again. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Um, and I had other items that is kind of a big larger discussion. Uh, uh, so 
the question is, should we consider a network IPLD as another breakout project from IPFS? Um, and the reason I'm bringing it up, uh, I've been uh, talking to a lot of our prominent users in terms of trying to figure out what the IPFS in browser should be as a minimal API. And it's clear that everyone is essentially using network IPLD with persistence uh, with a few bits and pieces of exception here and there. Um, it also become apparent after that, that actually IPFS slides the text I'll put together is kind of that. Um, so, and this kind of ideas that had been brewing in my head, it's clear that at some point lib P2P was identified as a separate thing that is useful on its own. And then same thing happened with the uh, IPLD itself, but it's just data layer. Is there, I think maybe it's a time to consider what another breakout could be that is IPLD with persistence and IPFS network baking it. Uh, and then IPFS could be thing on top. And people who don't care about the file system piece itself, they can happily use a smaller piece, uh, which turns out that is what Textile, Streetbox, and I can't remember right now who else, but many people use. Uh, I wrote a, a more detailed write up in IPFS notes as Dietrich, per Dietrich's suggestion at the place to do. Uh, maybe we can continue discussion of the idea there. Yeah, I don't know, my, my brief two cents on that is that it's not that, whatever, maybe it's just like a naming thing, but like IPFS is, is basically that. It's just that Go IPFS does and JS IPFS do way more things than are strictly required by IPFS. And so we should have libraries and we should have applications and the applications should not be named the same thing as the library. Uh, and that's that will actually make feedback. things less confusing. So that's a feedback I've been also getting a lot where mm -hmm. uh, it's like IPFS is an application and not a library and people want library. Um, so uh, I think that there's two ways to interpret this right now. And one of them is probably really terrifying after the entire team was cut in half. Uh, like this, this should like, this could translate into like extra stuff. Because if you're trying, like, you're basically saying, like, okay, there's IPFS as a network, and then there's IPFS as a product, sort of, um, and those are, like, different things, and it looks like pursuing them separately would be more work rather than less, um, but there's probably a way to approach this where you're actually kind of de-scoping a little bit and pulling back and saying, like, this is what IPFS it is it is this sort of network piece potentially um, and then we're doing a lot of experiments on top of that which is you know what you get when you install go ipfs and js ipfs you get all of this extra stuff that we've been working on that we're really interested in um, but that differentiation is is yeah really hard and very confusing so. i think it also speaks to things like priorities like I, I think if you just sort of like casually look at our repos you'll you will discover that like there are many issues with the fuse implementation Ooh. that nobody is fixing. And we'd like to fix them, but they're not really deemed like core to what is very important for the project as a whole to be working on right now. Right. And that's because effectively what we are working on right now is IPFS, the protocol and library and not so much like IPFS, the application is just helping you use it, um, right? So like it's a de-scoping effort in the sense that if you can separate out the library components and those are the things that you care about and maintain, and then the application has the min has full support for that minimal subset and then some extra stuff, you can like see where the lines, you know, where the priorities and the lines fall. Uh, so uh, on my end, one thing that has been sort of why I bring this up, as we try to embark into sharing node sync across browser tabs right now, it is actually very helpful to have something that is minimal and that is not full blown IPFS. Uh, so idea is to be driven by the user's demand sort of, uh, and clearly it is being identified that this is more or less what it is. Given also new IPFS, PLD stack that is uh, coming in, 
uh, I think it becomes more and more clear that there's just, I, what people are using is essentially IPLV and then they just want it to be stored and to be able to retrieve, which is much lesser scope. And we can also iterate on that without having to break anything, uh, either for application users or current GS IPFS users. Uh, and also can just rethink what would make sense for that specific use case, not all the other use cases. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't underestimate how many people are not thinking of it and using it only in that scope. Um, I mean, like it, that, that might sound attractive to me being that like I, I run IPLD and that's like, <laughs> like a very IPLD centric way of looking at it. Um, but I, I think that actually like a lot of people using IPFS right now think of it as like more of an API rather than a protocol. And there's a lot of API surface there for the things that they do. And files is like a very important part of that. Um, and then the network is like probably the most important part of that. Um, and by the network, I, I also mean the persistence layer. Um, yeah. And so like th those things are like super, super important to them. Um, and it's, it's a little bit more difficult than I think that we're giving it credit for to like trim down the API, for instance, um, because that would be like a necessary part of, of this change, I think. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, just it's also just to keep track of like time here. We're a couple minutes over, and while I think this is a worthwhile conversation, I think realistically we're not going to be able to touch this until Q4. Um, so I, I would kind of punt that, but at least we can mm -hmm. we can have the ongoing conversation. I think in the notes, um, but realistically, yeah. like nothing's going to happen for at least until Q4. Yeah. All right. Take your points out. We are over time. Uh, this has been the, so I mean, if you want to stay on and talk to Michael about, uh, about multi-formats, then please do. Otherwise, if you have to drop off, then please drop off. Um, yeah, this has been the cool. uh, IBFS Core Wiki Sync for the 13th of July, 2020. You can record the multi-formats part if you want to. We don't have to drop the recording. <laughs> the people have to drop off. It's up to you. Oh, I'll keep recording. It's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, I think people have been seeing this and uh, maybe overreacting a little bit in that um, you're, nobody's going to take this dependent, like okay, JSIPFS is not going to migrate to this stack anytime soon. Um, it, it's our view in IPLD that like when we write a brand new library, the first consumer of that should not be the user, our user with the most people. Uh, that That's kind of crazy. Um, Instead, like we adopt it, we use it, we sort of try to understand it and, and gauge its maturity um, and how much we think it's going to have to change over time because we don't want you to take a library and then, and then shove like three more breaking changes at you. Um, and, and, you know, and now we also have other consumers of, of some of our stack that have less users than you that are like a little bit easier actually to, to iterate like JSIPFS Lite, for instance. Like a good example is actually the block API where we, we wrote, I wrote that like a year ago and we've been, you know, putting a lot of our stuff on it ever since. But, you know, every three months we've sort of figured out like, ah, there's another breaking change that's going to have to happen to make things actually work the way that they need to. And so it's never, you know, we, we because we keep seeing these, we're not going to have you take it until we're done with these breaking changes. So that you take one breaking change rather than seven. Um, the JS multi-format stuff is similar and in some ways kind of bigger in that it's not only JavaScript, it's actually multi-formats as a standard and a specification is not changing, but the way that we've interpreted that into language libraries across the board has been wrong. Like we have, we have like taken the wrong approach to multi-formats. Um, and now that the multi-formats table has grown and the number of hashing functions and codecs has grown, it's very, very obvious how bad like some of this stuff is. Um, so the way that the libraries are currently implemented is that when you get a multi-formats implementation, you get a set of hashing functions, you get a set of uh, base encoders, you get a set of codecs. And these are sort of like part of the import chain wherever you kind of decide to pull in multi-formats. Um, and you get the entire table. Uh, these are much more obvious in JavaScript as a problem than other languages because you're confronted with how much code that you ship a lot more obviously when you ship the bundle. Um, but in JavaScript, even the size of the table is a problem. Like it's noticeable in the bundle size that there's this big multi-formats table in there. Um, like, you know, we, we look at the charts of like where the block API is, is spending a lot of its, its, uh, its budget on 
on this and like the, the table's not insignificant and it's only growing. Um, and we even started to get pushback on adding things to the multi-formats table because the table was so big and people were loading it into code. So this is, this was the wrong way to do things, right? So the way that we're, we're looking at multi-formats going forward in all languages, um, is that multi-formats is like an interface that you load up with the implementations, the table information that you care about. And the representations that you get from multi-formats are somewhat agnostic of needing to have that table information. So you can parse a multi-hash and know what that integer is, even if you don't have the hashing function. And you would know, I don't have that hashing function. Um, this bubbles up like really as far as, as CID, right? So CID has properties for the string codec that is a problem. Like we actually have to break that uh, because we have to be able to represent CIDs to things that we don't have a codec for. And you can't represent the string unless you have the table information. Um, so what we've been doing is like figuring out the interface that, that looks the nicest that we think is, is the right way to kind of load this information up and then sort of bubbling it up the stack and updating the block interface now. And so for most consumers, this won't look that different. Like right now, you are, sorry, like the old block interface for IPLD, you would like import the block and the block would come with a bunch of codecs. And now if you import block slash defaults, you'll get the block with a bunch of codecs and a bunch of hashing functions. Um, IPFS will probably just have its own block somewhere and you'll import that block and it'll have all the codecs and hashing functions and, and base encoders that IPFS cares about. Um, so at that level, it's not really going to change. But the fact that you have to kind of configure this and pass that block interface through all of your layers. You can't just import it necessarily um, because you may need to configure it or you may need to allow the user to configure it with more codecs or more hashing functions or something. Um, that's gonna be like a pretty substantial kind of code change, like architecturally, it's gonna change a lot of code paths. Since we know that this is such a huge break, we're taking all of the other breaking changes that we've been putting off for a long time. So there's other stuff in this refactor that is not strictly this multi-formats refactor. Um, we're getting rid of buffer and doing everything as uint eight array. That's a really big change. Um, we, you know, the, the CID change is also really big because it's a value type. Um, we've, we're moving to ESM because we don't want to also migrate to, to ESM in six months to a year. Um, this is just like stuff that it's easier to take now and deal with it than it is to, to suffer more breaking changes in the future. Um, I think that like some of the some of the things that have bubbled up, like the ESM stuff, is just not where you're going to spend your time if you're upgrading. Um, the value type changes are are the most significant and most painful thing to migrate uh, because you've got buffer dot is buffer code all over the place. You've got CID dot is, is CID code all over the place, and we've had to think really hard about what the failure cases should look like so that it's really easy to see where you need to update rather than having bugs appear transparently and you just do the wrong handling but not see an exception so um there, there's a million notes on that and, and different threads that, that um we can go over once it's time to upgrade but yeah this is like to get on your radar that like there is a pretty big breaking change coming but it's not coming for gsipfs anytime soon it's, it's you know it's, it's it's always been up to you when you want to upgrade, but we're not even recommending that you upgrade within the next like three or four months. Like we're, we're it's not ready yet. Um, and we actually have other priorities this quarter, so we're not going to be able to finish it uh, right now. So, uh, Michael, I have a question. Uh -huh. So once uh, in three months or so, mm -hmm. when you think that it's ready and we start upgrading and notice some other issues uh, mm -hmm. that would, that might require breaking changes, what would the mm -hmm. process be like then? Do you go back into incorporating those ideas or no? Yeah, or like well, I mean, ho so, so hopefully, hopefully most of that is worked out as we update our stack to it and as people like GSIPFS Lite upgrade to it. Like hopefully we shake out most of those issues in that process. Um, if there's any remaining though, like we're still open to taking a breaking change, you know, in the process of you upgrading if it makes that upgrade you know, easier and more reasonable. And, it, and it's a change that we need to take through that at more fundamental level. Um, so yeah, uh, maybe let me rephrase it to uh, differently. So one of the things that I've been trying to or wanting to do is uh, for the shared IPFS node in browser to yep. try to take the new IPLD stuff. And uh, we already have a block API and expose those and kind of have that as a replacement for the DAG API. So we can actually mm -hmm. 
learn about those things that may be incompatible or problematic earlier on, mm -hmm. given mm -hmm. that uh, teams that we were working on are much smaller than greater number of uh, IPFS users. Do you think it's a good idea to start doing it now? Or do you think it's something we should wait still? I think it or really depends else. on how, how it depends on how isolated that code is. Um, so if, th if that code is really isolated and it's not super integrated into the rest of the stack, it may be a good time to take it earlier because it would one give you experience with it and, and you would be able to flush out any issues early on. Um, and two, for something like this worker interface, some of these breaking changes are probably going to make your life a bit easier, right? Like having you into eight arrays everywhere would probably make yeah. your life easier than, than having to deal with the buffer polyfill. Um, so it, it may be worth it. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not in your code, so I can't like make the recommendation for you, um, but it, it may be something to think about. Um, another thing I should mention as well is that like, our view is that there is like an old world and a new world, and we wanna like not have a lot of steps in between. Um, but, like, but what I mean by that is like, we don't want you to take um, sort of a lot of piecemeal upgrades into the same code base because it just makes the migration all that much more difficult. Um, so like we, we know that we are probably not going to maintain two versions of every codec. Uh, we are probably going to just maintain the codecs for this new stack. So I actually wrote um, a legacy interface um, so that you can take a new style codec and it will completely convert that into the interface that you currently use in JSIPFS. So it literally converts back to buffer, it converts to the old CID interface, like everything should look the same and it should have the same structure to it that you would plug into, um, I think it's uh, GSITLD format or something like that, that library, I can't remember the name of it. Um, but yeah, it, it, like that is the way that you should use the new stuff in the old space until you're ready to just kind of like fully upgrade. Um, but yeah, so, if you have something so, that's totally isolated, I mean, to some cool. extent, JSIPFS so, Lite. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, this all sounds great. Um, what I'd really like to see from the IPLD team is some PRs that implement some of this stuff in IPFS mm -hmm. and do some of these migrations. Um, like, so, for example, libp2p have delivered a whole bunch of breaking changes, but they've always mm -hmm. submitted PRs that actually then upgrade IPFS to use the new versions of libp2p and whatever the new interface is. I'd love to see that from the IPLD team as well. Um, because what I'm hearing is quite a lot of when you upgrade and when you take this, but like there's, as you yeah. quite rightly point out, the, that stuff is very deeply ingrained in, in IPFS yeah. and it's going to be. A yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if the changes were not to value types, I think that we could do that pretty easily. Um, but changing a value type is, is just substantial. Like it's not, it's not a, one, it's not a small PR and it's also like something that impacts the ecosystem on top of JSIPFS, right? Like this isn't, this isn't a change to JSIPFS, it's a change to like all the libraries that are just using JSIPFS because they're not getting the buffers anymore. Like they're not going to get the old CID interface anymore. Um, so like, that's just, it's not something that you can kind of take piecemeal. I think the closest thing that we could do is, um, and there's an example of this, is um, the CLI, uh, we, we sent a PR for import and export of car files. Um, and that uses our new interface and it's isolated to only the CLI. So it doesn't impact like the whole rest of the stack um, and doesn't have to like, it, and, and it can be kind of disentangled. And if, if you notice like, in that code path, it actually is pulling in the new, the, well, the old version of the new block interface. Um, and that will get upgraded actually to like the, the very, very new stuff in the near future. Um, but like, that's the kind of thing that, that we, that we're, we're really looking for opportunities to send you um, to, to get feedback on. Um, so yeah, it'd be great. Like if you, if you could look at that PR and also for other reasons, I think that we do need to, to close that out and figure out what we're going to do for the import and export. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, like that, that's really as far as we can go be, just because the value type change is such a big, big deal. Um, yeah, it's not really something that we can, we can do on a small basis. Um, I wish that there was like a better example. But to some extent, like, um, I think one thing that might really help though, um, and it'll be a little different for you, but um, at some point, JSIPFS Lite will take this API. And we'll work really closely with them on that. Um, and 
pulling you all into that PR just to look at the code and see some of the differences, I think will be really educational to think about how big of a change this would have to be for JS IPFS, um, for instance. Um, and like, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't want to get back to the conversation we were having before, um, but it may, it may even be worth considering like a future version of JS IPFS being a lot of code on top of JS IPFS Lite. Um, and if that was an easier way to make the upgrade, that, that might also be um, a road that you might want to consider. But yeah, I mean, like I said, like, this isn't my project. Like, I can't, I can't make a lot of these decisions for you. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll do what we can. We'll keep doing stuff um, like the car import export when, when we see them. So I, you made like a passing reference to like, this will also occur in Go, but then like talked almost exclusively about the JS side of things. So what does yeah, that look like in Go? Yeah, so there's no timeline for that in Go. Uh, like we, we, like this is like a thing that we know needs to happen someday, but there is like, there's no prioritization to it. It's not, we're, we're so constrained for Go resources. And as you can imagine, they're so yeah. like allocated to Filecoin that yes. uh, there's just like, there's no, nothing close to a date on this. Um, Rust is, is doing this right now though. Um, so there is, you know, some work happening at Rust and it's very similar. Um, I mean, obviously different because it's Rust and Rust is always a, a bit different than JavaScript, um, but uh, the, the same sort of approach um, to shipping with, with no um, table information and no codex and sort of loading it up. For you. Um, Michael, I, I have a question based on your comments that you made earlier, which was you only have an adapter that can take the new codec implementation and turn it adapted to the current codec implementation. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why would not existing codec library just use an adapter and like proxy to the new implementation so you don't have two different versions coding? So <laughs> because that's been essentially you mentioned you in eight arrays as a thing and yeah, yeah, yeah. doing a lot of work trying to get you in eight arrays across all these codecs, but the old ones. So it would be nice yeah, if yeah. there was just this um, adapter so I don't have to so we thought of doing that and didn't, um, mainly because the old codec interface has so much extra kind of boilerplate and endpoints that there's not like a discrete single place where you can do the translation. You have to do it in multiple places. And so we're just like, you know what, it's probably easier for us to just port the old codex over to the new style and then export this legacy interface. Like it's actually, it's actually easier for us to um, just, yeah, to just migrate all of the old codecs than it is to try to come up with a translation layer in that direction. Uh, oh, I, I saw, okay, I got it. I, I saw the translation yeah. was working the other way around, but no, I see what you're saying. No, 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 we just take the new style and make it in the old style. And that, that's a lot easier because in the new style, you know, it's, it's one function to encode and one function to decode. Um, like that's really, <laughs> that's really easy. Uh, um, so another thing that I kind of relate to all of those things that I'm, or not all of them, but we talked about block service at this, or not block, IPLD with networking as a separate thing. And mm -hmm. I also mm -hmm. mentioned that IPFS Lite is actually that. And you talking mm -hmm. about maybe talking, working with uh, Textile to get the new IPLD stuff and maybe yeah, IPFS yeah. could be on top of IPFS Lite. So all of these things kind of interconnect. So one thing that I wanted want to do and figure out how is, and I talked to Carson about it too. Uh, so Doug API essentially is a block API with some the encoding decoding happening under the hood. Uh, and mm -hmm. the block API right. is kind of nice because it's much more uh, smaller API in a sense that there's not much going on. Mm -hmm. So is, is there any way we could have that so that block API can be agnostic of the block implementation, new versus old one. So people who want to try the new IPLD stuff can do so by using new IPLD block and the IPFS block API. And if they don't want to do that, then they can continue using DAG API. At least that would be really interesting for me to do the shared node thing because that would address the use case that Textile has with their IPFS lights. They can use just switch to the new API and do that. Uh, and Streetbox express some interest too. And people who do not want to do that, they can continue using the existing DAG API. Uh, but so the, the, I, I honestly would recommend that you don't try to put the interfaces in parallel and instead just write like a very tiny translation layer when you know it needs to exist. Like it is just not that much code to take the current block API in, in IPFS and like translate it into blocks back and like the new block API back and forth. Like if what you want is the new block API, then you can just like have IPFS doing the old thing and write 
maybe five or six lines of code that will translate them back and forth to the new block. Um, like taking like a bunch of effectively redundant code into core IPFS to do that doesn't, doesn't make a ton of sense to me just because it's not that hard to migrate between these two things. Um, the, the only thing that you lose is like an efficiency gain because the new block API has so much like caching that it does internally. It's, um, it's really fast. I, I, I um, think you might have misinterpreted my goal. My goal okay, is okay. to have a block API that just more like a binary API uh, to the block store. And IPLD block gives you a way to create those binaries and decode those binaries. And Doug mm -hmm. API is sort of, while people want to migrate, it's there, but hopefully they will migrate and it will be unnecessary in the future because mm -hmm. block A, like IPLD block and block API will kind of do all of the things already. Uh, does that make more sense? Kind of, I mean, like, isn't that really easier? Like, I mean, Alex would know more than me, but like, can't, I think it's called like the block service interface, right? Like, can't you just instantiate that and get it on the network and everything and then, if you have that block service interface and yeah, it's it's pretty, it's pretty, it's, yeah, yeah, it's pretty, at that point it's pretty trivial to just like take the data that comes out of it and turn it into the new block API. Like that's it's really really easy. I mean, you'll have um, the buffer polyfill in there, but whatever. That's what I meant. The IPLD with a networking piece, uh, okay. but I'm kind of trying to detangle that. Maybe this is too much for this call, and we can. Yeah, I think we're getting <laughs> we're way yeah. over, and I think we're getting too into weeds here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, hopefully I cleared that up. Uh, yeah. We're not trying to make like a ton of extra work for you. We're actually trying to do the opposite and trying to limit the number of upgrades that you all have to take. Um, and, and just like make sure that we get things right. Um, so that when you upgrade, you're not um, constantly sort of driving through a bunch of other issues that we hadn't uncovered yet. So. Uh, I, I just want to like echo what Alex said, which is like, you know, mm -hmm. sort of PRs welcome. Like the yeah. YPFS has like, we have car stuff. We have like half a graph sync. <laughs> we, have, we have go IPLD format. Like this, yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean um, like, like, yeah, yeah. So, so one is that like the, the new interfaces for Go are, are coming along and they're, and, they're, and they're pretty far along now. Um, I mean like they're used in, in graph sync for instance. Um, I think that like, Again, like we, we have a much, we have a resourcing issue across the board um, for things that aren't Filecoin. Um, and that, that is particularly deeply felt on the Go resources side. So it's just, it's, it's really hard to, to give you any kind of a date on when that would happen. The, the only thing that I can promise honestly is that like you will have much better documentation on how to use the new Go interfaces by the end of this quarter. Like th that I can definitely guarantee. I can guarantee that um, GraphSync and any other libraries that use Go IPLD Prime that are in Filecoin will continue to be upgraded to the latest stuff. I can definitely guarantee that uh, because it's like in the Filecoin pipeline. Um, but like there's just not, there's not a lot like for the next quarter at least that we can, we can really say definitively. Does that include like documentation on the the best way to create a DAG and get it into IPFS right now, which I assume is something like use one of our structures to create a car file and then import it. But like the um, documentation on how to do that is also not really there. And yeah. It's something yeah. So, like HackFS users are running into and stuff like that. Okay. Um, yeah, if, if you could just give me some, just a few more details on, on the use case there, I can work it into the list of things that we're writing up um, and make sure that that, that happens. Because um, we're, we're writing something sort of like that, like we're, we're writing like a, a sort of thinking and data structures tutorial and then like how to build those data structures with IPLD without really talking about how they get slammed into storage uh, because that varies so much by language. But then at some point we're going to need to like go into each language and say like, this is the best way to do that for these different um, interfaces. And yeah, I think that a lot of the time, it, actually, no, I, I, I can guarantee you that for every language we'll just have like, okay, here's how to get that into a car file. Um, like whatever you just did, here's how to get into a car file. And then here's how car files go into IPFS and, and Filecoin. Like we'll definitely have that documentation. Um, but there may be a more efficient way if you're in Go and you can like import Go IPFS to like not actually go into a car file and just go directly um, into IPFS. Um, that would be like an, an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, I guess I meant like thinking things. Like in particular, the issue I ran into whatever over the weekend was uh, 
HackFS user who's trying to import like a nine megabyte JSON file, right? <laughs> right. Which right, is right, fine, right. which is fine. But like, okay, but now BitSwap won't send it because it's more than a meg. Yep. So yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So like, think about it the right way. So we need some like, how do I think about IPLD correctly? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So so we're starting with like, here's what an in-memory map looks like in your language. That's a data structure. Here's like what it looks like when we turn that into something that's an IPLD, where we get this hash board and you can go get it. And then from there, like that becomes a link, and this is how you create a data structure that links to different parts of the thing, and that's how you build bigger structures that go over that limit. Like that, that is definitely something that we're working on that we'll have. Well, we should have language um, examples in JavaScript, Go, and Rust actually for all of that. Cool. That's really great to hear. Actually, we're, we're sounds like we're, we're working on the right things. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, this is great, everybody. I think I, I missed the meeting in between, but it's all good. This was worth it. <laughs> Thank you all. And I'll talk soon. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. See you on the internet. <laughs>